Hello, Crossroads. Thanks again for joining our online worship service. I want to remind you that we have two services on Sunday morning at the Crossroads facility on Thornhill Road in Auburndale. The first service starts at 9 a.m. and the second service starts at 1030. So whenever you feel comfortable coming back to in-person services here on our campus, you are more than welcome to attend either one of those services. And until then, though, we hope you continue to join us online. And we are glad that we were able to provide these services for you. Today, we're continuing in our Psalms teaching series, which we started last week. And uh, we're going to be looking at Psalm chapter 2. And I hope you had some time this past week to dive into the Psalms. And uh, so this morning, we'll continue with the time of worship where we're going to be reading some Psalms, as well as singing some worship songs together. And today, we have the opportunity to celebrate our high school graduates. So you'll be hearing more about them shortly. Uh, but let's just join now in a time of uh, worship and praise to our King. Psalm 89, 1 and 2, it says, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. Our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. And I'm stretched on His love endures forever For the life that has been reborn His love endures forever Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise 
Psalm 104, 1 through 5 says, Praise the Lord, my soul. Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. The Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. He set the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. Today we are celebrating our high school graduates and they have done an amazing job of making it through this season of their lives and it's quite an accomplishment. We're proud of all of them and so we've put together a video to just highlight them today and we're recognizing them in person at our worship services this morning here at the Crossroads campus. But for those of you 
who are not able to attend yet, we wanted you to know who these young people are and to be able to celebrate this accomplishment with them. So just enjoy this video as you get to know our graduates a little bit more. Hi, I'm Lauren. I'm very thankful for how my school has handled the whole pandemic. I'm very thankful for all of my teachers that have taught me things like Pam. I'm sure you all know Pam. She was my um, broadcast journalism teacher and I've learned a lot from her. And I'm actually going into the field that she's um, taught me for the past three years. And I'm just very thankful for, to have these people in my life and to have experienced the things I have experienced with all of my teachers and everything I've learned. Uh, I'm very thankful for um, Channel Lakes Collegiate High School especially for giving me a good education and uh, the ability to graduate with my AA degree. I'm very thankful for my family because they uh, were through it all with me, you know, the tough times and the good times. And uh, I'm very thankful. For Hi, I'm Noah, uh, Noah Little, and I'm graduating from COL, uh, Chain of Lakes, and my plans are to go to Florida Polytechnic University. Uh, I plan to do computer science degree, so that way I can work at uh, Publix in IT, and then eventually I really want to design video games.
Hi, uh, my name is Jillian, and after high school, I am planning on going to Polk State College to major in criminal justice sciences. Uh, I'm hopefully going to get my bachelor's there, and after that, I want to go into work in the child welfare kind of social worker career. Um, and if not, then I would even want to do uh, criminal psychology. Let's bow for a word of prayer together. Father, we're so thankful that we can come together as a church family and call upon your name for the power and the strength that each one of us needs to continue to walk faithfully with you each day. And Lord, we're thankful for your body, the church. We're thankful for you calling us out of darkness into your light, for allowing us to have your spirit dwell within us and for the gifts of the spirit that you've given to us to uh, build up the body of Christ and to encourage and edify each other. And so, Lord, I pray that those who are gathering for this online worship service would be encouraged in their walk with you. Lord, that your Holy Spirit would bring refreshing and renewal to their lives. And we thank you that uh, each day we have the opportunity to serve you through our words and through our actions. And Lord, may we uh, seize those opportunities that you present to us each day to share with others the reason for the hope that we have in our lives. And Jesus Christ, you are our hope and you continue to be our firm foundation upon whom we build our lives. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross, for your resurrection power that you've given to us through your spirit. And Lord, it's in you that we move and live and have our whole being. And Jesus, it's in you that all things hold together. So thank you for your grace, for your mercy, and for the way you continue to guide us in our lives. And we pray that you would continue to be glorified for the remainder of this service. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Crossroads has many wonderful mission partners. One of those is Options for Women Pregnancy Help Clinic, and they do a wonderful job of presenting the gospel to women in need. And I had the opportunity this past week to sit down with Marilyn Paul, who is the Director of Options for Women, and we had a Zoom interview, and I'd like to share this interview with you. So just take a few minutes and listen and get an update on this wonderful ministry in our local community. All right. Well, today I have the opportunity to be here with Marilyn Paul, who's the Director of Options for Women Pregnancy Help Clinic. And Marilyn, I want to thank you for joining me for a brief interview and I'm just so glad that our schedules are connecting in this way so that you can give an update to Crossroads Community Church regarding the ministry that you're a part of, and we know that God is doing great things. So I just want to say thank you. All of our mission partners uh, are truly faithful in their calling, and you and your leadership with Options for Women is no different. You have been incredibly faithful, and it's a blessing for me every time I get to connect with you. So if you don't mind, maybe just giving an update. I know this has been a a challenging season for all ministries. We're all just trusting in the Lord for his provision. Mm -hmm. So why don't you just share briefly maybe how you've seen God provide during this season for Options for Women. First of all, I want to thank Crossroads Church because we would not have been able to continue on if it wasn't for partners like you and your church. And we are so extremely thankful for all of you that have donated and continue to support us through um, your, your, not just financially, but I know that you all pray for us and thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure if the church uh, knew that we were able to purchase the property right next door to the abortion clinic. And we have some beautiful stories coming out of that. Um, we have many, many girls that come there, quote, accidentally and unquote, and um, many of them have chosen life for their babies when they come there. We're so Great. thankful for that opportunity. Um, during this time, uh, although we have four clinics that we usually run, we did uh, the Dream Centered. We decided to let that go for a little while and focus on the one in Bartow and the two uh, that are close together near the abortion clinic. 
Uh, we actually decided not to do the uh, wellness checkups and the STD only, but focus on those pregnant women and the babies. Uh, because when COVID happened, uh, we went to all of our girls and asked them what they needed to do. Some had to stay home with kids and some had just health issues. So in one day we cut our staff from 15 to six. Wow. And yet in March, uh, even though half of March we were that way, we doubled our numbers in March from February. Wow. That's, That's how amazing God is. And April when we were totally at that number, our numbers stayed strong and steady. Many lives were saved. And of course, now they're coming back and we'll be full staffed again by June 2nd. Well, that is really good news to hear about how God is moving, even in the midst of some challenging days that we're walking through. Yes. And one of the things that I love about your ministry is your heart to really partner with the local church. And yes. um, you see that as a very important aspect of your ministry. Why don't you share a little bit about how you're trying to do that in regard to just uh, connecting more with the, the churches in our community. Absolutely, and uh, Pastor Mark, you know, I, I email you or text you from time to time and say, please get a hold of so-and-so. Um, we just feel like listening to the hearts of these girls, they are so confused. And even when we pray with them and we share the gospel with them, we're understanding more and more how important it is that these girls are taught and they're discipled because we just feel really bad sending them in a car, even after sharing the gospel and let them go on with the lifestyle that they're living. Mm -hmm. So having churches that we can uh, connect with and say, would you please reach out to this girl or her family? And we've had some really great stories from that too. And we will continue to try and pray to get these girls. We'd love to see them just give their lives wholeheartedly to Jesus and be connected to a solid church group and do away with the friends that have drugged them down such a desperate past. And they don't have, um, just seeing these girls, they don't really have those Christian families or even role models. So churches that like yourselves that are so willing to open your hearts and your doors, I can't thank you enough for what what you're willing to do. Thank you. Well, and we believe so much in what you're doing, and it is neat when uh, churches can connect with other types of ministries just to bring about that holistic healing that people need in their lives, spiritual, Absolutely. emotional, and physical. So we thank you for promoting life in our community and for celebrating life, and we know that God is the author of our lives. Yes. And we have all been knit together in our mother's wombs, and we have all been fearfully and wonderfully made. And so we are so privileged to be able to, to partner with you in that powerful ministry that you have. If you had to maybe highlight a couple things that would be big prayer requests for you or the ministry in the coming days, how can Crossroads be praying for you strategically? Well, and that's some of the things that you and I talked um, before the video started. One of the things that came out of this is that I needed to jump in and plug a lot of holes. And one of those things was to be connected face-to-face -face as an advocate to some of these girls. And Pastor Mark, I heard some stories that just touched my heart. It was hard for me not to just grab them all and take them home. And just to pray intently, uh, immensely for these girls. Um, I had one that, that the father of the baby had just died in an accident. And here she was not knowing what to do. Another girl that her mother destroyed this girl kicked her out so she could stay with the boyfriend that was abusing the daughter. Wow. It's just amazing the stories. And so just to have healing, spiritual healing, and just sure. that these girls would just understand that the peace of Christ is the only thing that's going to get them out of this situation. But um, I learned so much by being face to face with these girls. And that's our biggest prayer that they would find Jesus. Right. They find hope and everlasting hope. And that, that they would just be covered uh, with wisdom that they don't know anything about. And they get to see what a real family looks like and those kind of things. And also pray as our team is coming back. I know they're in different levels, as I'm sure in churches they are. Right. Some some have a little more anxiety, some don't, but that, that we can just focus on um, trusting in Jesus and taking care of our patients the right. best 
possibly can. Yes, very well said. I appreciate you sharing that information. And I would just love to pray for you and uh, the girls that you mentioned uh, right now. And let's just lift thank all of this you. up before the Lord. Father, I just thank you for Marilyn and for her heart for others, for the gospel to move forward and for people to have their lives completely transformed, Jesus, by your power, by the power of your spirit. Uh, we do pray for these girls that are being ministered to through this Thank ministry. You. Uh, Lord, you know that there is tremendous brokenness in their lives, and yet it's through your power and through your grace that mm -hmm. lives are restored, that people find their new identity in you. And Lord, I pray that these uh, young women would truly reach out to uh, local churches that um, can potentially Thank connect you. with them so that they can be a part of your family, Lord Jesus, mm -hmm. your church and to be discipled and to have that spiritual formation in their lives and, mm -hmm. and that sense of family that they so desperately need. And Lord, I pray that as Marilyn has shared, that as uh, workers and her leaders and teams start to come back to work, um, Lord, there's just some things that uh, with this environment, with this virus are challenging to work through. I pray that you would give all of them wisdom and that you would give all of them peace as they return Amen. to work. And Thank I pray for your protection over their lives mm -hmm. physically, Lord, uh, against sickness. Mm -hmm. against this virus in their lives, I pray for health, that they would be strong and healthy and spiritually renewed to be able to uh, make a, an impact for you through the power of Jesus in the community. Mm -hmm. Lord, we thank you for the ways that you've provided financially for options for women during this season. Amen. We pray thank for your you, ongoing, Jesus. continued faithfulness in that regard in the days mm -hmm. that you would continue to be glorified in all things, Lord, through options for women, but also through Crossroads. We thank you for our partnership. And we ask mm -hmm. in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I appreciate you so much connecting with me and giving the update. And we will continue to lift you and your team up in prayer in the days ahead and trust God for good stuff, right? Amen. And thank you again for your awesome church. We love you guys so much. Love you too. Talk to you soon. Well, Crossroads, it's always a privilege to open up God's Word with you. And would you please open up your Bibles or turn on your iPads or your phones to Psalm 2. And we started our Psalms teaching series last week, and we looked at Psalm 1. And so I want to encourage you to continue to spend time in God's Word each day and really dive into one of the Psalms and just linger over it. Last week we looked at how Psalm chapter one talks about meditating on the law of the Lord or the word of the Lord day and night. And so there's a challenge there before us to really linger in, the, in God's presence through his word. Psalm one and Psalm two are really a combo package. You know, if you go to McDonald's or Wendy's and get the combo meal, that's really what Psalm one and two are. They are connected. And for a little review, if you look back at the beginning of Psalm 1, it starts off by saying, blessed is the one, or happy is the one. And we saw how there are only two roads to walk on in this life. The blessed road that leads to life, and the wicked road that leads to destruction. But now look at the very end of Psalm 2, specifically the last line of verse 12. It says, blessed are all. So Psalm 1 starts with blessed is the one, Psalm 2 ends with blessed are all. There is this bookend blessing that's included in Psalm 1 and 2. And so the question is, how do we live the blessed life? We saw that last week, and we're going to continue to see that in this psalm as we continue to set the stage for where we're going in the weeks ahead. Weeks ahead. So Psalm 1 and 2 are really foundational psalms. A uh, couple other background notes on Psalm 2. It's a royal or coronation psalm. It was used during the installation of Israel's kings. But it really points forward to the true king, who we know to be uh, Jesus Christ. And so it came to be known later on as a messianic psalm in that it really talks to us about the anointed one, the Messiah. And Psalm 2 is referenced many times in the New Testament because of that reason. Um, there's four basic sections to this psalm. So if you're a person who likes to write in your Bible, I would encourage you to take some notes actually in your Bible and mark off these sections. Verses one through three are section number one. Verses four through six are section two. Verses seven through nine are section three. And then verses 10 through 12 are section four. 
And my teaching today is actually going to walk us through all of those sections. And this is a song or a prayer about the king, the king of Israel. And so we're going to look at this psalm in regard to how we are called to respond to the king. The Bible tells us that there is a king above all kings. There is a Lord above all lords. And at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess or acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so I want you to see Christ in this psalm. And I want you to see how this psalm calls us to surrender to the King of all kings. But let's read this psalm together, and then we'll dive into it. Verse 1 says, Why do the nations conspire, and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up, and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Verse 7 says, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession." You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss the sun, or he will be angry and your way will lead you to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. There are only two responses to the king of kings. There are only two ways to live like we saw last week. And so response to the king number one is rebellion, uh, outright rebellion against the king's authority. And in order to see this, we're going to look back at verses one through three, that first section that I told you about. So let's look at this again. The psalm begins by saying, why do the nations conspire? You know, we don't have to get very far in this psalm uh, to find out the, the futility of rebelling against the king's authority. And it's all encapsulated in the word why. Why is an important way to start this psalm because it communicates the absolute futility of rebelling against God's authority in our lives. We all know what happens when we choose to ignore God's word and his ways and do our own thing. Paul wrote to the church in Rome, and he says that the wages of sin is death. Another way of saying that is the wages of rebelling against God and his authority in our lives is death and destruction, like we saw in Psalm 1. Psalm 1-6 says the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Rebellion against the king always has the same result, destruction. You know, we have all rebelled against authority figures in our lives. Parents, teachers, coaches, our boss at work, and the results are always the same. It never ends well, does it? There is always pain and destruction on the other side of rebellion. So let's take another look at these verses 1 through 3. It says, Why do the nations conspire? Psalm 1 was focused kind of on the individual, blessed is the one. And now Psalm 2 kind of has this corporate sense of nations. And he says, why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? It's interesting that that word plot in verse 1 is the same word that um, Psalm 1 used for meditate. So in Psalm 1, the blessed person meditates on the law of the Lord day and night. And in Psalm 2, People who are rebelling against the king's authority are plotting or meditating in vain on how to do that, how to rebel against God. And the psalmist says it's all vain activity because we can never win when we fight against God. So we have these nations, these people, these kings that are, that are plotting 
in vain, literally meditating, um, trying to use their own thoughts to rise up against God. And in verse 2, when it says the kings of the earth rise up, that's literally saying it's like they're taking their stand. They are preparing for battle to fight against the kings, uh, excuse me, against God's anointed one, the, the holy king. And that word anointed in verse 2 is the word in Hebrew for Messiah or in Greek for Christ. And it's interesting that in Acts 4, I would encourage you to write some of these references down because Psalm 2 has all of these connections with different places in Scripture. But in Acts chapter 4, verse 27, the early Christians, when they were praying, actually prayed Psalm 2, verses 1 and 2, to describe Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel as a group who were conspiring against Jesus Christ, the Anointed One. And we all know that that was a futile attempt to conspire against Christ because he was put on the cross, he laid his life down, but then he took it up again through his resurrection and was victorious. So uh, the plans and the schemes of the kings and nations of this world cannot thwart the plans of God. But we see the thinking of these kings and nations and people in verse 3. They say, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. What they're saying is, I don't want to live under the authority of God. I want to live under my own authority and really be my own king. Because you see, if we don't worship the king of kings, we are inevitably going to make ourselves king. And once again, that always leads to destruction. Uh, the world says, I'm not going to listen to God or do what God wants me to do. I'm not going to be accountable to anybody other than myself. And that's the sense that we have in the first three verses. There is a rebellion against God's authority. But then we see the response of the king of kings to the rebellion of the people. And the response of the king in one word is wrath. Look at verse 4 again. It says, The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. So here we have an interesting thing in verse 4 about the, the laughter of God. And God isn't laughing because sin and rebellion is funny. He's laughing because sin and rebellion is futile. It's, it's a futile effort to rebel against the king of kings. And so it says the one enthroned in heaven laughs. Um, we may think that our plans are going to prevail, but it's actually God's plans that always prevail. Um, he doesn't take pleasure in our disobedience and in our rebellion, but because he is perfect in all of his ways, a refusal to worship him and to, to bow to him will lead inevitably to him rebuking us. It will lead to divine anger and wrath. Wrath, the wrath of God, is a reminder of the holiness of God and a measure of God's hatred of sin. I'm going to say that again because this is important. We see this theme of the wrath of God uh, a lot in Scripture but sometimes it's one of those characteristics of God that we would just rather skip over. You know, let's get to the love of God. Let's skip over the wrath of God. But the wrath of God is a reminder of the holiness of God and a measure of God's hatred of sin. The wrath of God um, is also the, the holiness of God stirred into activity against sin. So when we see God's wrath in verses 4 and 5, we can know that it's just his holiness being stirred against the activity of sin. The wrath or judgment of God is based on the refusal of people to acknowledge that God has installed his king in Zion, which is a reference to Jerusalem. Look at verse 6 again. God says, I have installed my king. And so in the Old Testament, it would have been the Davidic kings, and all of the line leading up to the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. But God says, I have installed my King on Zion, 
my holy mountain. Zion is just a reference to Jerusalem. And so while this psalm had relevance during the coronation ceremonies of the Davidic kings in the Old Testament, we can see that it speaks ahead to the king of all kings, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, which leads me to the next point that the identity, the true identity of the king mentioned in this psalm is Jesus Christ himself. Verse 7 says, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. When I was younger, I loved playing this game called Connect Four. And many of you have probably played it. And you're just trying to connect four little plastic circular pieces in this other plastic structure. So you just drop these pieces in and you're trying to connect four, either horizontally, vertically, or diagonally. Well, verses seven and eight are kind of like a connect four that I wanna highlight for you. But these verses have significance in many places in the New Testament, but I wanna just highlight four. At the baptism of Jesus Christ, God the Father said these words about Jesus. You are my son, whom I love, whom I love with you, I am well pleased. And then on the Mount of Transfiguration, when the glory of Christ was revealed, God the Father said to Jesus, this is my son, whom I love. And then in the very beginning portion of the book of Hebrews, uh, it begins by telling us that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is greater than the angels. And it says, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father. And so those are three, baptism, transfiguration, the reference in Hebrews, and then the last connect four I want to make is referencing verse 8, where it says, Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. Which leads us to the Great Commission passage in Matthew 28. So that's the fourth connection, where Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And he says to his disciples, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So there was no earthly king from the pages of the Old Testament, no one else in the Davidic line who had the dominion and the power that's referenced here of having all nations and all the earth as his possession. But we know that to be Jesus Christ, and so Jesus has all authority and he sends out his disciples to make disciples in all of the earth. So the identity of the king is Jesus. And how are we responding? Are we re rebelling against this king? Or are we going to respond with the second possible response, which is submission. Submission to the king. And in order to see this, let's look at the last section, starting in verse 10. The psalmist says, therefore, you kings, be wise. There are only two teams. Jesus' team wins. Be wise in your choice of which team you select. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. This is a submission posture before the Lord. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule. This is a direct contrast to verse 3. Instead of saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles, let us rebel against their, the authority of God. Uh, this is saying there is another response of submission and actually celebrating the lordship and the kingship of Jesus in our lives. Celebrate his rule with, with trembling. There's that reverential fear and awe of worship of the Lamb. And then in verse 12, it says, kiss the sun. In the ancient Near East, kissing the feet represented an act of humility and submission. The way of blessing, the way of life comes through serving the Lord, celebrating his authority, not rebelling against it. And so uh, there is this powerful vision in this last section of the psalm of submitting to the lordship of God.
which connects back to Psalm 1, that the life of blessing is surrendering to the word of God, the law of God, and meditating upon it, walking in the ways of righteousness, which we noticed leads us to Jesus, the true righteous one. And so when we respond to God in submission, there's the response of God towards us, and it's he provides refuge in his presence. The very end of this psalm, blessed are all who take refuge in him. Someone once said that there is no refuge from God. There is only refuge in God. And there is this joy of being in Christ and having our identity firmly planted in him. In Acts chapter 4 verse 12, it says, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Salvation is found in no one else. Paul picks this idea up in his letter to the church in Colossae, where he says in chapter 2, verse 6, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, which is submission to the kingship of Jesus, he says, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him. This is our identity in Christ the King. And then later in that letter in Colossians 3, verse 3, Paul writes, For you died. In other words, we died to our sin. We were buried with Christ in baptism. But then we were raised to walk in a new life. He says, For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. And so when we submit and when we surrender to the lordship and the power and the authority of Christ in our lives, we receive the refuge that can only be found in him. And the refuge is salvation and peace and protection and just experiencing his love that he lavishes upon our lives. And so once again, Psalm 2 follows up Psalm 1 with this uh, call to make a decision. Will we know the king and surrender to the king and trust the king? Um, I want us to bow for a word of prayer and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart today and submit to the king of kings. Father, we thank you for your word and for the way that it draws us into your presence to a place of humility and, and recognition, Jesus, that you are the king of all kings and that we are called to surrender to you and to submit to you and to bow our knees in your presence. I pray that everybody who is watching this video would sense the power of your spirit, bringing them to a place of conviction of sin and turning from the ways of this world and embracing you, Jesus. For it's in you that we live and move and have our being. Thank you for the way that you bring about salvation and transformation in your presence when we are in you through faith. Lord, just help us to receive these words of truth from Psalm 2. And may we live them out in a way that's honoring and pleasing to you this week. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being a part of our worship celebration today. Have a great rest of your day. See you soon.